Okay, um, it's now 7.35, so let's get started. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is Psychedelic Buddhism. Uh, sorry again for the last minute uh, rescheduling, uh, which uh, might be the reason why we have a smaller audience today, but we're very glad that Mike was able to join us um, in the end. So thank you, Mike, so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll just begin by introducing Mike. Um, Mike, uh, Lama Mike Crowley met a Tibetan Lama, Lama Radha Chime Rim Rinpoche. Am I saying that correctly, Mike? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, met the Tibetan Lama in London when he was 18 years old. He became Lama Chime's first student and has continued to study with him to the present day. He took refuge in the five pencil vows on May the 1st, 1970, and after much study and meditation was ordained the Lama on January 1st, 1988. He is the founder of Amrita Zong, an American extension of his teacher's group and a member of the advisory board of the National Psychedelic Sangha. The author of Secret Drugs of Buddhism and also now Psychedelic Buddhism, he lives in Northern California where he's joining us from today. Great. So um, Mike is going to give uh, a talk for about 45 to 50 minutes about his book. Um, and then uh, we will leave about 10 uh, minutes for questions, um, maybe even shorter than that since we've got a small audience today. So, Mike, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Um, well, what you've said is uh, mostly correct. Um, I um, I remember when I um, when I studied Buddhism first of all, I ran into a teacher known as Chodgam Trumpa Rinpoche. And uh, this was in the mid 60s. And he actually lived in a commune with a bunch of hippies and took LSD with them. And um, I spoke to one of the hippies who he had uh, tripped with. And uh, the guy told me that he was, the Trumpa was very uh, critical of the way they they consumed their LSD and he said, you know, that you should be more serious about it. There's a, um, it's a very, very uh, useful and powerful tool. Um, and he in fact told certain, certain hippies that they should stop taking LSD. He, he wasn't of that opinion generally, just for certain people. And uh, I was actually present at the Buddhist Society in Eccleston Square in uh, in London, and uh, when he he told certain um, middle aged matrons that they should try LSD, and um, they they were obviously he considered them too uptight, and they should uh, loosen the, their stays a little by. Um, uh, trying LSD. However, when he went to the United States, he, he emigrated to the United States and stayed there until he died. Um, he told my teacher that he was going to teach Tantra in the United States, Buddhist Tantra, that is, um, with the proviso that he would leave um, one element of um, the Vajrayana out of the equation completely. And that element, I understand, was psychedelics. He had seen how Westerners uh, behaved on psychedelics and uh, wasn't entirely impressed. And... Um, a few years later, my own teacher, um, who was a, a lifelong friend of Chogam Trungpa, um, my teacher who you mentioned, uh, Lama Rara Chime Rinpoche, um, he said to me in a, a, a private interview, he said, uh, people tell me that you take psychedelics. Is this true? And I said, yes. Yes, it is. And he just had one word to say uh, in response. He said, good. <laughs> that was all he, he said to me about psychedelics. So I've um, uh, assumed that uh, I was on the right track. 
And uh, anyway, I have um, certainly had um, intimations from psychedelic trips that they were in fact uh, very, very similar to um, uh, to revelations which you can have on psychedelics. Excuse me, I have to eject my cat who's getting far too familiar with the, the laptop. Just a second. Come on. Out. Sorry about that. Um, yes, so uh, I have been studying with uh, Lama Chimi for about three years before I finally uh, took the plunge and uh, uh, took the uh, refuge ceremony with him. And if and this is the the ceremony in which you uh, officially become a Buddhist. And uh, I was admitted to the Kaju Order, the uh, one of the um, one of the four great Buddhist orders of Tibet. And uh, it was a few months after I had taken refuge, as the expression is, when I. I took LSD with a, f a few friends at a house in the in the countryside of Buckinghamshire, and I'll um, I'll just uh, I'll just read you um, a passage. It's from this book, Psychedelic Buddhism, um, which is uh, going to be published in about two weeks. I understand. Um, anyway, I describe the trip I took with my friends. It was 1970 and I was among a group of young people gathered at a house in the English countryside. The French windows opened onto the patio and the scents of a warm summer evening wafted in from the garden. Friends chatted amicably Two pet rabbits hopped apparently at random through the deep shag carpet, and J.S. Bach's The Art of Fugue emanated in geometrical precision from our host's geeked out hi-fi. This sublime music seemed perfect for my elevated state, so I closed my eyes and let the music transport me. Then, appearing before my inner eye like imagination only far more vivid, I beheld an infinite array of crystalline spheres suspended in space within its own three dimensions. This is to say that it was entirely separate from the three dimensions which I experienced with my eyes open. Each sphere was so perfectly spherical and so perfectly clear that it contained within it the perfect reflection of every other sphere with infinitesimal accuracy. But that was only the visual part. It was apparent to me that each sphere was nothing but the reflection of every other sphere. I am at a loss to explain exactly how I knew that each gem in the matrix was composed only of the reflections within it, but at the time, it was as obvious as the closed eye visuals were resplendent. This sight, though internal and personal to me, was truly awe-inspiring. It was as if I were witnessing hidden dimensions of space that exist in addition to, and at right angles to, the usual three dimensions. I rested in this vision, wrapped in wonder, for what seemed an eternity, observing firsthand the matter wave duality of quantum mechanics while simultaneously witnessing a vision 
that seemed heavily laden with profound spiritual significance. This was merely a few years after I'd begun studying Buddhism and only a couple of months since I'd formally become a Buddhist, having taken refuge on May the 1st of that year. It was also some time before I had come across the philosophy of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, in full, that's the Mahavaipulya Buddha Vitamsaka Sutra, or the great extensive sutra of the Buddha's flower garland, if it's rendered in English. Um, it had a metaphor of Indra's net. And it said, the Buddhas know that all phenomena arise interdependently. They know all world systems exhaustively. They know that all phenomena in all worlds are interrelated as in Indra's net. So that's a direct quote from the Avatamsaka Sutra. Um, but unless we are familiar with the legend of Indra's net, this last sentence is meaningless. Fortunately, an, in, an ancient Chinese sage has explained it for us as follows. The manner in which all phenomena interpenetrate is like an imperial net of celestial jewels extending in all directions infinitely without limit. As for the imperial net of heavenly jewels, it is known as Indra's net, a net which is made entirely of jewels. Because of the clarity of the jewels, they are all reflected in and enter in into each other ad infinitum. Within each jewel, sim simultaneously is reflected the whole net. Ultimately, nothing comes or goes. If we now turn to, for instance, the southwest, we can pick one particular jewel and examine it closely. This individual jewel can immediately reflect the image of every other jewel. As is the case with this jewel, it this is furthermore the case with all the rest of the jewels. Each and every jewel simultaneously and immediately reflects each and other, each and every other jewel and the infinitum. The image of each of these limitless jewels is within one jewel appearing brilliantly. So that's a passage from um, the writing of a seventh century Chinese master known as Tu Shun. He was the founder of Huayan, a Chinese school of Mahayana Buddhism that eventually spread to Japan as Kagon. Apart from his apparent reluctance to engage with the topic of interpenetrating wave packets, Tushan's description comes remarkably close to my experience. Until I read these words, I had assumed that my vision had been a private, personal revelation. The discovery that I shared the experience with an ancient Chinese sage who had described my trip in detail a full 12 centuries before I had been born led me to two possible conclusions. The first is that the experience of Indra's net is universal, available to a few profound meditators, in which case, by witnessing Indra's net, I had inadvertently stumbled upon an alternative route to the wisdom of the ages, namely psychedelics. Or, two, the experience is attainable only through psychedelics, in which case, if Buddhists of an earlier centuries had witnessed Indra's net, then they must have taken psychedelics to do so, with the corollaries that ancient Buddhists had no problem with psychedelics and moreover had employed them to great effect. Whichever of these alternatives was in fact the case, Tushin's explanation of my vision was thrilling confirmation that I was on the right track and that if used correctly, psychedelics held the key to deeper spiritual exploration. But I wondered, what if I combined the two using both meditation and psychedelics? Among the consequences of that long gone moment of insight was the creation of this very book. To help others 
apply these miraculous compounds in a system of self-improvement and profound insight. I also became interested in art that evoked similar elevated states to those experienced with psychedelics. And you can see some of my work as well as the work of Mark Henson and William Lloyd in the color inserts in this book. So uh, that was my initial experience, not my first experience with psychedelics, but it was my first experience which uh, revealed the um, the psychedelic nature of uh, early Buddhist exploration. Of course, um, they needn't have, uh, have taken psychedelics, but I know for a fact that uh, later Buddhists certainly did use psychedelics. Um, my uh, my revelation of of this, the revelation to me, um, was in a uh, a very secret ceremony, and I, and so I can't um, reveal the uh, the nature of that um, initiation to you, um, but I can. Uh, um, dance around the topic and uh, tell you of all the other things which uh, which seem to indicate that this is the case. This is um, actually true that uh, that Buddhists did take psychedelics. In fact, I mentioned Chojam Trungpa earlier, and um, one of his uh, uh, comments to his. Um, housemates, the hippies who he took LSD with, was that um, LSD is very useful, but there are more powerful things in Tibet. These are called Dutsi Rubu. Uh, Dutsi is uh, Tibetan for Amrita. Amrita means, literally means deathlessness, no dying. Um, but it's one of the synonyms used in the Rig Veda for soma. Soma means juice, and it was the juice of a particular mushroom, which was consumed in the, a ritual called the Agni Hotra, the fire ritual. Uh, that's the, what Agni Hotra means, literally. Um, they didn't explicitly state what it was. Uh, the Rig Veda speaks of it. Uh, I mean, the Rig Veda is mostly about the ritual in which Soma is consumed. Um, but it gives very little hint as to what Soma was. Uh, this, this is a topic which is made more explicit in the later Vedas. The Vedas were, um, first of all, the most ancient was the Rig Veda. Then the Sama Veda, which uh, was exactly the same as the Rig Veda, word for word, but the, the verses are rearranged so that they're in the, the correct order for uh, use in the Agnihodra ceremony. Then after that came the Yajur Veda, um, which is usually spoken of in the literature as if it's one book. It's not. It's three entirely separate books, um, which were revered, well, still are revered by Brahmins, uh, but in different areas, different parts of India, they call um, different books the Yajur Veda. They are um, known as the white Yajur Veda, the black Yajur Veda, and the partridge colored Yajur Veda. Um, partridge colored means basically speckled black and white. So after, after the Yajur Veda uh, came the Atarva Veda, um, which is. Uh, 
far more uh, uh, concerned with um, spells and uh, um, how to deal with demons and so on. Um, interesting, but not really revelatory uh, to us regarding psychedelics. The uh, Yajur Veda, on the other hand, um, mentions that um, there are um, there are red rudras and there are uh, blue rudras, and um, by reading between the lines, we can. Uh, make out that these were referring to mushrooms. The red mushroom was probably the original uh, soma of the Rig Veda, and that was, um, is assumed to be Amanita muscaria, um, which is certainly psychoactive, but I don't think of it as a a psychedelic, really. It's, it's marginally a psychedelic, but, it also has a lot of physical effects. The, the blue rudra that they were talking about uh, seems to be Psilocybe cubensis, um, a, uh, a psilocybin-containing mushroom which has a blue stem. The bluing is caused by the oxidation of psilocin, um, which... Uh, um, psilo um, psilocin oxide is dark blue. Um, and if you're offered mushrooms, choose the ones which aren't dark blue because psilocin oxide is inactive. It's only when, uh, um, only before it's been um, bruised that uh, psilocybin is, is actually active. Um, well, my studies in this uh, in this realm have been far more extensive than most Buddhists, um, and I have uh, um, turned up quite a lot of uh, of data about uh, the psychedelic nature of Amrita. Um, in fact. Um, my first book, um, Secret Drugs of Buddhism, is about the uh, the stuff which um, is available, uh, but typically ignored. It's available in that it's uh, it's not um, bound with uh, oaths of secrecy, such as um, we find in the. Um, the initiations, which, um, by the way, I'm I I have been looking for, uh, ooh, about at least twenty five years for somebody who has also um, uh, had the um, the chakra samvara initiation according to Luipa, the the Mahasiddha Luipa, because there is something in that initiation, which I think is obviously about mushrooms, uh, about psilocybin mushrooms. But I can't talk about it with anybody else unless they've, uh, they've had the same initiation um, because, because of the vows of secrecy. Um, if you know anybody who's had that initiation, please let me know and I'd love to chat to them about it. Um, anyway, uh, the, um, the, the, the latest book has, uh, has plenty of, uh, um, practices which can be done to enhance your psychedelic experience. And, um, they show you how to use psychedelics uh, to enhance your meditation. I consider these two halves of the same, the same practice. Um, oh, my, I, I took copies of my first book to Australia when I, uh, I spoke at a conference there. 
and I couldn't find any Buddhists, even um, Buddhist booksellers wouldn't touch my book with a barge pole because it was about drugs. And we all know that drugs are bad, um, except that uh, ancient Buddhists didn't think that. Um, in fact, there is um, a part of the the five um, vows that you take, or you can take, you don't have to take them. They are uh, available for Buddhists to take, but they, they are not to kill, not to lie, not to steal, not to, um, and not to be profligate sexually. Um, there are, um, there are rules that say you, if if you're married uh, to one person, you can't have sex with another person. You can't have sex with children, and um, and a few things like that. Then the final the final vow is that you're not to drink alcohol, and that's all. That's all it says. Don't drink alcohol, and um, I've uh, I obeyed that for many many years. Um, but many Buddhists have gone overboard on this one and say you can't consume anything which uh, alters your consciousness. And um, that's not what it said originally. It was just that you can't drink alcohol. Um, so because of this restriction, um, Buddhists have been very secretive about, um, about Amrita. Um, what is Amrita? Um, well, originally, it was philosophy mushrooms. Um, but as Buddhism progressed, it came to mean um, several other things, and um, the, the later tantras speak of something called panchamrita, which means the fivefold elixir of immortality. And uh, this um, is, uh, is speak, uh, spoken of um, as, uh, as being all right, th these, are, these are the five Amritas, according to the, uh, the later Tantras. They are the meat of a dog, uh, a cow, horse, elephant, and the great meat, which is human meat. And I don't believe any of these are to be taken literally. In fact, some Tibetan texts say, "Oh, if you can't, um, if if you can't get cow, peacock is a, an acceptable substitute." Well, um, peacock in Sanskrit poetry is known as nila kanta, which means blue throat. Um, this is, in fact, very similar to the Sanskrit nila kanta, which means it, it, it sounds almost the same. Um, but nila kanta means um, blue stem, not blue throat, and it's one of the uh, one of the by names of Shiva. Um, I won't go into it now, um, but it's in my book. Um, Secret Drugs of Buddhism explains uh, that Shiva was originally just a um, uh, a secret name for the philosophy cubensis mushroom. So the um, the the five elixirs of the Panchamrita. So cow was obviously the mushroom which grows on cow shit, which is psilocybe 
cubensis and four other substances. I um, investigate what these four other substances might be in, uh, in my first book, Secret Drugs of Buddhism. Uh, after the Muslims invaded India, they, uh, they destroyed most of the, um, the, the Buddhist monasteries and universities and so on. And so um, the secret teachings of Buddhism in India uh, were lost. Um, but fortunately, uh, Buddhism had uh, spread to other nations like Tibet, um, which um, was never, uh, which never came under the the, the sway of the uh, Muslim invaders. Now in Tibet, um, they have a tradition of uh, terma, and terma are documents which were said to to be hidden by uh, great teachers of the past. Um, usually, usually they were uh, concealed by uh, Padma Sambhava, also known as Guru Rinpoche. And, um, and, and uh, many of these uh, um, termas are literally um, books, but occasionally um, they are uh, a jar of pills um, or uh, um, uh, sometimes they're ritual implements like purbas. Those who discover these uh, secret teachings um, the termas were hidden, often um, in caves, inside statues, inside um, the columns of temples, and um, were intended to be discovered at a much later date than the time when they were um, concealed originally. Um, and some of the uh, the the Tertons, which is which means um, a person who discovers a terma. Sometimes uh, these uh, th th these tertons uh, discovered uh, so many termas that they were called terton kings. There are five terton kings. The last of the terton kings was Pamalingpa who um, was, uh, was born and brought up in Bhutan, although he did um, travel to Tibet proper um, a few times. And uh, he uh, he was born to a, a, a very uh, a spiritual family, which had a lot of uh, um, important uh, spiritual teachers, but uh, was very um, poor in uh, in uh, monetary terms, and so uh, his uh, his parents couldn't afford to keep him when he was uh, growing up, and they set him to work with a blacksmith, and he learned um, blacksmithing. And while he was uh, he was learning this stuff, he uh, he lived in a ruined uh, shrine in the forest um, with a a nun, a Buddhist nun. And one day, he wandered off into the forest to uh, find food to eat. It was uh, in mushroom season, and he was hoping to find some mushrooms, but he, uh, he couldn't find any at all. And he was um, going back to the shrine 
empty handed and feeling very dejected when he ran into an old ragged um, man from the east of Tibet, from Kham. Um, and uh, the, the Kampa, as he is called, asked him, why are you so miserable? Why are you looking so glum? And he said, well, I've been out looking for mushrooms and I can't find any, and I'm just hungry. And the, uh, the, the Kamba says to him, well, if you're looking for mushrooms, what's wrong with those right there at your feet? And he looks down and says, oh my God, you're right. There's mushrooms here. And he, he picked them up and um, put them inside his robe and carried them back to, the, uh, to his uh, shrine along with the uh, the old camper and um, he, he cooked a, uh, a flower and mushroom curry which doesn't sound all that appetizing to me but but um, it was satisfying enough for these two and um, Perlingpa felt rather odd after he'd eaten them and decided he needed to go and lie down. Well, um, the Bhutanese people in the, uh, the, the non-raining months often put their beds on the roof of their house, the flat roofs of the, their houses. And uh, he laid down there and closed his eyes and had what is described as a dream. And in this dream, he, he dreamt of a part of the of the river that flowed near his uh, his dwelling in and um, in the dream he saw that there was actually a cave underwater and if you if you descended into the cave um, the cave actually um, rose up inside the cave it was um, it was dry and uh, he and so he told all his relatives um, that he'd had a revelation about the 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 presence of uh, um, ancient scripts ancient scriptures being uh, hidden in this cave and uh, and told them to bathe put on their best clothes and accompany him to uh, this, uh, th this bend in the river. He dived into the river and was gone for about two hours. And uh, the, his relatives were all saying he must be dead. He must have drowned and uh, been swept along with the current. Um, but lo and behold, he, he uh, reappeared after two hours carrying a, uh, a box made of rhinoceros skin and in the box there was a terma and uh, the tradition in Tibet is that um, people who discover termas, tertons as they're called, are actually um, reincarnations of uh, the Students, the, the the students of Padma Samava, he he had twenty five Tibetan students. So one of the uh, one of Padma, uh, Pema Lingpa's relatives had gone with him to the the riverside. Said, "Oh, I suppose now you're going to tell us that you're a reincarnation of one of Padma Samava's students." And he says, no, not at all. No, I am a uh, student of Padma Sambhava. Who do you think that old Kampa was? Um, so the, the, the tradition in Tibet is that Padma Sambhava, having uh, uh, intimate knowledge of the Amrita, uh, which we mentioned earlier, um, was in fact immortal because the Amrita 
uh, destroys death, as it, its name suggests, uh, deathlessness. Um, ah, no, mri, death, or die, and ta is, uh, turns it into a noun. So not dinus is basically the literal translation. So he, he uh, assumed that the old uh, Kamba was in fact Padmasambhava and that uh, the mushrooms which had been gi given to him by Padmasambhava were um, Amrita and uh, um, that he'd been initiated uh, by Padmasambhava. Um, so he went on from the, the he translated the uh, the contents of this um, uh, this rhinoceros hide box, and one of the uh, the statements in it, the last, the very last um, statement in the uh, the the uh, the term the termer he discovered told him where he could find the next termer. And so he spent his life um, finding these termas, and each of them would describe where he could go next to dis to discover another termer. Um, so this shows that the uh, um, the the tradition of, uh, of termas and uh, their discoverers is actually a tradition of psychedelic use. Um, and uh, it's, it's well known in Tibet. Um, the stories of the Tertons is well, uh, well known and it is known but um, not chatted about that they were uh, in fact um, about psychedelics and um, the tradition of um, of tertons um, revealing psychedelics is a, is a living one in Tibet and its neighboring countries. In fact, there was a um, a Tibetan teacher who lived near here in uh, in Trinity County called Chakto Toku Rinpoche. And um, one of his uh, one of his acolytes, Lama Doje by name, um, was leaving uh, the, uh, the the Gompa, the, the monastery which was founded by Chakta Rinpoche. And he invited all of the other uh, students of uh, Chakta um, to come to his uh, his his house, his, uh, his little um, cottage which he had there on the grounds and um, help him to um, eat and drink all the, the the food that was there before he he left the place. So I was told by one of the uh, the inhabitants of the um, Chantud Gompa that he the my informant was an alcoholic. At at this point in his life. He is not now, but he was then. And so um, they had a few ends of wine bottles, which they finished off, but it only um, served as an appetizer to this guy who was determined to find some more alcohol about the place. So he rummaged in the kitchen, looking in all the cupboards and found a medicine bottle which he, he removed the cork and sniffed it. And sure enough, it smelt like alcohol to him. So he drank the whole bottle. What he didn't realize was that this was the Amrita for um, future initiations. 
And for the next five days, five days, he was completely out of his mind. He, um, he saw um, heavenly beings, Buddhas and Dakinis, which is a, a, a female um, enlightened being. And um, it turned out that this, this bottle of, uh, of booze was actually the, um, the concentrated form of Amrita, which was going to be used in uh, future initiations. And um, he, he, he was told by the Lama, Lama Doje, uh, to disregard any teachings that he was given by, the, by Dakinis as he hadn't had the requisite um, prior initiations to be able to understand what they were saying to him. Um, so anyway, I have this, this evidence, although it's, uh, it's only a fragment of, uh, of um, just one person's uh, story uh, about the the existence and use of Amrita um, and that the, the Amrita used in, uh, in initiations is truly psychedelic, although it is often diluted to uh, an, a totally innocuous state. But if you have it in, um, in its concentrated form, it will, um, it, it will uh, propel you into this psychedelic realm. So uh, let me see, how is the time going here? Um, We've got about uh, eight minutes left. Perhaps we could transition into questions, Mike? Yeah, that like that's what I was thinking, yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for the talk, Mike. Um, really appreciate your, uh, your insights on this um, incredibly interesting subject. Um, and also very interesting to hear about the many different strands of evidence that, that, that there are for um, psychedelics being a, a, a key part of Buddhist initiations. Um, I wanna go back to, to what you mentioned at the very beginning about Indra's net. Because it is fascinating to me that there is that there was such a close parallel between your psychedelic experience um, and um, what this Chinese sage wrote about uh, in was it the seventh century? Is that correct? Um, yeah, I, many, I many, think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I have it here. Um, <laughs> let me see. Um, Yes, these the the sixth and seventh centuries. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Nice. Um, but it seems like that's just one example of uh, many other kinds of striking parallels that people have found um, between psychedelic experiences uh, and Buddhist texts. There's of course the the famous story of Timothy Leary and Ram Das, um, who drew analogies between um, their psychedelic experiences and, and the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, which was obviously fraught with many issues. Uh, and, um, you know, their, uh, their interpretation of, of the Tibetan Book of the Dead was not necessarily that faithful um, to the original source. Um, but, but, you know, people do seem to have um, striking similarities between their trips uh, and things that have been written about in these texts. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious what, what you make of this. Um, you suggested two possibilities in your talk, one being that, um, Either um, the uh, either Buddhists in the past were actually taking these psychedelics themselves, and there seems to be abundant evidence for this. Mm -hmm. But also, it seems to be the case that you know not every uh, Buddhist has has taken um, these uh, these these medicines in the past. Secondly, um, uh, it's also possible that you just happen to access the same state uh, on psychedelics as you do on meditation. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm curious if you, could, if you could just say more about um, what to make of these striking similarities. Right. Um, uh, 
I think there are, there, as you say, there are, there are several um, um, examples of this, this kind of um, revelation that you, you will, you're likely to uh, run across. Um, passages which if if you've not had the experience you will not understand the the the, the passage um it, it just seems that i was i was lucky in that i i i chanced across the uh, um this this uh this vision which was um uh described um many centuries before i'd had it um, um and just um incidentally seems to have been described by uh, a chinese um person and, and uh, turned out to be in exactly the same um vision that I'd had. And if it hadn't been for that uh, description by Tu Shun um, of what Indra's net actually meant, I would have just skipped over that, that line of, uh, of the Avatamsaka Sutra and, um, and just um, treated it as something I, I didn't quite understand or um, was just a descriptive note that uh, um, had no relevance to me. Having had the experience, I really, um, um, I really gobbled up that uh, that description by Tu Shun and uh, um, saw the in immense relevance of it to my particular path. Um, I'm sure that other people may have come across other, other paths, other other portions of the uh, uh, the truth too. But uh, um, I just put this down in my book as being um, a very uh, relevant passage. Um, by the way, I have tried several times since then um, by uh, consumption of the same drugs of hashish and, uh, and LSD uh, in various um, concentrations and uh, doses, but I've never had another experience of the uh, Indra's net. I just assume that I had stumbled across what um, Dr. Alexander Shulgin called a plus four experience, which is a, uh, he, he describes um, psychedelic experiences um, as plus one, plus two, plus three. And they, they describe the, um, the various types of experience uh, that you get at, at different dosage levels and different depths of, uh, of experience. But he, he reserved the plus four for a, a, an experience which is, uh, it's like a, uh, the, 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 a, gr a grace, as it's called in, uh, in Christianity, a, uh, a, an experience which is uh, um, perhaps only ever experienced once and um, and has a profound effect on you. I've uh, not been able to replicate it. I've had um, similarly profound experiences, but not that precise one. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question or wandered away from the topic. Uh, <laughs> But if there are anybody else, any other people who'd like uh, some yeah. elucidation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's plenty more to discuss there, but uh, we'll move to a question from Charlie. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
Thank you. Thank you for the talk. That was uh, yeah, interesting. I learned, I considered some new things there. Um, so my question is, so clearly you have to simplify it, two schools of thought in Buddhism. You should do this as part of your practice and, and you should not. And I see... Oh, I, I would disagree there. It's not in Buddhism. This is in Buddhists. This is modern Buddhists who are saying you shouldn't do this. There is nothing, nothing okay. at all in Buddhism which says you shouldn't do this. Right. But, but if you were to speak to two people who would identify as Buddhist or follow that kind of practice, one might say, yes, I believe uh, in the use of psychedelics with meditation, with this spiritual journey. And another might say, no, I don't, I don't think so. Are you saying... This. Yeah, but what's their reason? Why why don't they think so? Is it just a personal um, distaste for psychedelics? Well, I I've read I've read Buddhist Sanskrit, and there are some kind of assertions they make, kind of like a rule you shouldn't do this. And there's some more I think reading between the lines where you can interpret something as you know in the in the case of drugs, you know, alcohol is quite explicitly forbidden. Other things, yes. if you read the lines, it, you might interpret that as that's that's not allowed. So, I well, it's not patient. allowed. It's not allowed if you like take a pencil. Uh, any, but you don't have to take all five vows, or you don't have to take one of the five vows. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, so, ba so based on that notion. Do you think the direction you move in, the direction that psychedelics can help you towards with that practice, is that the same direction as if you if you don't interact with drugs, if you it's like very sober? Are you, you know, is it helping you move in the same direction as if you didn't, or is it actually showing you something else, something a bit different? So it's a, you know, it's not it's not something else or something different. It uh, it actually is the um, um, it's much the same as the progress through um, through um, simple meditation, but it just happens to be a lot uh, faster. You you can uh, you can access um, realms that are inaccessible um, uh, without doing decades of meditation. Um, okay. And does that also apply to you know, after you've had these experiences just in your sober life? You. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, could, you, uh, could you put that another way? I'm not sure I understood um, you. You're saying the experiences you get through psychedelics are ones that you would have to be, you know, practicing heavily for 10 years to, to have uh -huh. the same thing. But, but what about, you know, there's a lot about, you know, when, when you're not meditating, when, right. you're, when, you're, when you're, you know, you're not having these experiences. Well, it, it, Tushan, the Chinese um, founder of the, uh, um, the Huayan sect, or oh, in Japanese, it's the Kagon sect. Um, he doesn't mention anywhere, as far as I can make out, uh, that he used psychedelics. Uh, but he did um, explain Indra's net in great detail. So I'm assuming that he got there through meditation. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas... I got to the same place through taking psychedelics. Okay. So I guess this question is, is, is it, my question is really, is it the same place or is it different? Um, I don't want to talk for too long if someone else has a question. I, I'm, I'm assuming that as Tu Shun described my experience in detail, um, except that he'd had the same experience um, like 14 centuries before I did. Okay. Hmm. If you, if you look at um, kind of neuroscience when they when they're recording people's brains when they meditate when they take a psychedelic, 
you do see the how coordination is inter is kind of is flowing in the brain will be similar with meditation but there's also something that's quite different it's opposite so there's actually some some ways the brain is dealing with information is actually different um and see it, it it goes up with meditation it goes down with psychedelics so if you look at the neuroscience there is actually is there's something that's opposite with psychedelic use compared to just straight meditation so i, I just wonder you know is it actually the same or is it, is it, is it different is there something else? um i'm uh i'm unable to answer that question i'm afraid sure, sure, sure. yeah yeah more, more rhetorical okay thank you um, we're a bit over time now, but maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, if anybody else has a question. Liz, yes, go ahead. Yeah, so my question is, um, often psychedelics uh, and Buddhism um, have been linked, but it's usually uh, we look at Tibetan Buddhism um, rather than any of the other schools of Buddhism. Um, and I'm just wondering um, what, if, if you've come across any Buddhists who are from the Theravada tradition or from, you know, just other traditions that have um, what their thoughts are on the use of psychedelics. And if there's any, if there's a difference between Tibetan philosophy as opposed to Theravada uh, philosophy and why the, the parallels are often made um, with Tibetan and not others. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to point out that um, Tibetan Buddhism includes Hinayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, and Vajrayana Buddhism. All of the, the um, forms of Buddhism which are found in Tibet were originally in India until they were wiped out by the Muslim invaders. Um, there are other uh, forms of Vajrayana Buddhism in um, in Nepal, in Bhutan, in Sikkim, in Mongolia, and in Japan. Uh, there, there have been um, Vajrayana schools in China, um, but they were absorbed into Zen um, during the early Middle Ages. Um, I would say that most of these have uh, have developed um, uh, cozily with uh, alongside of um, psychedelics. For instance, in um, northeastern China, there was uh, the, the use of um, of two psychedelic mushrooms, psilocybe, uh, psilocybe uh, liniformans, and uh, um, psilocybe argentipes. And uh, uh, this tradition uh, was carried from China to Japan and um, is outlined in a, in a, a, a book called the Shoujo Mandara Scroll, um, which was um, written in the ninth century. In, and this scroll has um, very uh, accurate drawings, um, which um, I, at least I identify as, uh, as the, uh, uh, the, those two philosophy species. Um, it is known from uh, from modern um, writers that uh, some of the um, the yogins of Tibet have used psilocybe mushrooms. Um, there is a book called "The Center of the World" uh, by Ian Baker, in which he describes giving a uh, a philosophy mushroom to a Tibetan Naljopa, uh, that is a yogin. Um, 
because he, he was asked for it, the, the Nanjoba asked him, are you going to eat that or shall I? And he said, oh, you can have it if you like. And, uh, and the guy reported back that it was very, um, very useful to him. So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but- uh, that, that... No, you, you did. Yeah, I guess, um, I guess I'm just thinking more in, like, in the minds of, you know, the public and popular culture, Tibetan Buddhism is also the, 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 kind, the form of Buddhism that we tend to talk about when we're also talking about psychedelics. Um, and also we have class, classic Timothy Leary's psychedelic um, uh, experience based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So. Okay. Um, one thing, I, I spoke to um, Ralph Metzner, who was the, the other author mm -hmm. of, uh, of the psychedelic experience that you didn't mention. There were three authors. One of them was Ralph Metzner. I, I had a chat with him about um, psychedelics, and he said, oh, the, the problem with their translation of uh, the psychedelic experience or the Bardo Todo as it is in mm -hmm. Tibet um, is that it, it, it didn't um, put the events in the right order. The event, the, the experience of the psychedelic was not um, in the, the, um, the order which it was explained in the book. And I mm -hmm. said, well, you do know that uh, all tantric texts are written um, out of order and you, you're, uh, you're explained what order to read the, uh, the texts in um, part of the initiation in the, uh, the, the so-called lung of uh, the, um, the tantric initiations. Um, and so I wouldn't expect it to be in the right order. And he was flabbergasted by that. Um, but I must um, uh, explain also that um, tantric uh, Buddhism was also present in Hinayana. Um, in, in Burma, there was a school called the Waidzya school which um, which used psychedelics unfortunately uh, this was a this was a Hinayana um, school which did psychedelics but unfortunately it died out in the middle ages well not a, it didn't exactly die out but it turned into a, a debased form of um, uh, of wizardry and uh, and magic um, but it originally um, had the, uh, the, the use of psychedelic Amrita, like Vajrayana Buddhism. Very right. interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, again. Um, we're uh, quite a bit over time, so we're going to end the event now. Um, but thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, and uh, I encourage everybody to... Uh, check out Mike's new book, uh, Psychedelic Buddhism. He's got the cover with him there. Do you want to just show show the uh, the the audience uh, the book, the, the front cover? Yep, there it is. Great. Um, on sale now. Is it available in the UK anywhere, Mike? Um, uh, Can you get it from Blackwell? It's not available from bookstores anywhere for the next two weeks. Right. But I know people who had ordered it in advance who have received their copies already. So... Yeah. Uh, you can certainly order it from a bookstore. Um, okay. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Mike. Uh, and um, I hope that uh, your path your path cross, crosses with uh, OPS's path uh, sometime again soon. Thank you so much. Oh, well, my pleasure. Cheers.